Is anyone recording? Yep. I'm recording. Eight, two, four, six. Everything's six. good. Let's start. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Everything's good to go. I think we should just start. Yeah, okay. So one, two, three. Welcome to Let's Make the Future, a discussion with five. Oh my god, we are three now. Welcome to Let's Make the Future, a discussion with three friends about future trends, technologies and their implications for human society. We are coming to you from all over the world. Why don't we give an introduction of ourselves? I'm Daniel Valenzuela, a mathematician and social impact enthusiast currently based in Munich. My name is Hossein Kuhani, a technopreneur from Iran, currently living in Michigan, working on biomedical devices and future cyber technologies. I'm Michael Curry an independent software developer and entrepreneur from Canada, currently living in parts unknown. Here's the format of our show. We'll first talk about the latest future-related news. Then we'll discuss a particular future and topic for about 30 minutes. The final 10 minutes are reserved for an elevator pitch battle. Let's get started. News. The news. Segwit, segregated witness, is just activated for Litecoin. Litecoin, Ethereum, and Bitcoin are the main three players of cryptocurrencies and SegWit is a new change to the protocol of Bitcoin and Litecoin that was proposed a year ago. It's basically a soft fork that increases the security while decreasing the chance of transaction malleability and at the same time it increases capacity. It was initially proposed for Bitcoin but it was not voted for yet enough. So the mechanism, it's really interesting how it works. 95% should show a green light to have the new change accepted. It's about 35% on Bitcoin now, but it is approved and voted and stayed more than 95% for two weeks for Litecoin, which is basically a backyard of Bitcoin. And it went through and now we are at the post SegWit era of Litecoin. And we are all excited to see how it's going to perform. I think that's really good news. It's been, I think, pretty clear for a very long time that the underlying software architecture protocol of Bitcoin is insufficient to meet the new applications that have been conceived of. And Ethereum was a reaction to that. And it's nice to see that there's another option and the forces of competition will undoubtedly find out which is the best. So I'm not familiar with all the technical details, but I'm looking forward to even more opportunities and options available in the cryptocurrency space. Well, it's interesting since three weeks ago that SegWit was being flagged green uh, for Litecoin, the prices increased dramatically and Litecoin was used to be less than a dollar a month ago and now it's over $15 huge and dramatic increase for Litecoin and shows uh, how people are getting interested in using Litecoin after SegWit is uh, activated. Another interesting thing is that I heard that Bitcoin, which is 41% used by Japanese people, also had a dramatic increase that actually surpassed the all high amount of the price of Bitcoin, which is 1350 And the reason is that the Japanese government started to proceed through Bitcoin for businesses. And now it's going to be a semi-official cryptocurrency in Japan. What does it mean by official? Like the government will tax it or something? That's a good question. I'm not sure. That's all I heard is that it is started to being regulated, which is a big change because most governments, the first reaction they show is that they want to stop the usage of cryptocurrencies, but Japan has taken one step ahead and they've started to see how they can regulate it for businesses, which is something opposite of what the state of New York did, which is New York is the only state in the US that Bitcoin and many services and many websites that uh, work with Bitcoin are not allowed to do business in the state of New York. And it's something that it was flagged a long time ago. Wall Street basically is behind this political enforcement. This is so, one of those topics where it does seem like there's a large amount of specialist knowledge needed to understand the really specific technical matters, but generally 
Okay, I'm gonna try. I, I learned some stuff from watching the video, a lecture from Andres Antonopoulos. Originally, he was Greek and he came to the US when he was very young and he's now has a book called Mastering Bitcoin, Unlocking Digital Cryptocurrencies. I've ordered the book and waiting for it. So in the meantime, I was uh, watching one of his lectures and he was explaining how blockchain technology works in principle. And what I learned was that blockchains are actually obviously a chain of blocks that each block is based Basically, um, let's say it's a it's a box of an um, algorithm that checks the inputs, and each time you give an input, that input is gonna be processed and check if it is what the block is designed to be. So, for example, you're guessing. It's like you guess that the block is going to be this ASCII number, which has like 32 bits, and then you just check bit by bit if key of that block, and then if for some lock that you have, you find 32 bits, then you have activated that block. Do you hear Can me? You repeat the last two sentences. A blockchain is like a tree that has different branches and each, it has a big trunk, which has the longest chain of the blocks and each branch can lead to different blocks and each person has to spend a lot of computing performance using a CPU or GPU to calculate and try so many different bits in order to activate a block. So right now, actually the mining rate of Bitcoin and some other cryptocurrencies heavily depend on the processing performance, on the state of their technology, how fast you can compute and try different bits to activate a block defines how fast you're mining that cryptocurrency. And at the same time, the uh, very interesting principle that I um, realized about blockchain is that it's a democratic process. How? Let's say I activate a block today. And if you want to work on the next block, you have to decide based on which previous block you're going to test the new block, if it's going to be activated or not. So. Let's say there's the block which is yellow and there's a block and it's red and there are two branches and people want to move on and find the next block in order to mine more cryptocurrency. You should choose. You should choose if the yellow is going to be dominant in the future or if it's red. So if more people rely on the red block and then try to find the next block based on the red to continue that branch, then red becomes accepted and that becomes the main chain. And if you have spent a lot of CPU and GPU, a lot of computing, which is all wasting or spending electricity eventually, it will be kind of wasted because then you're not spending your electricity on the red block that is going to be widely accepted. So this democratic growth, this evolution of the blockchain is actually the driving force of the decentralization of the mining of this cryptocurrency. On the other hand, on the economic part of it is that so now we are having an asset. We are having an asset which works like gold. Let's say there's gold under the crust of the planet and it's going to be mined on a decentralized fashion with a specific rate that depends on the price of electricity and depends on the technology of solid state electronics and now how can we use it the economy works that now we have a decentralized amount of supply a material that we can hold value with so the value is hold in one of the blocks and now this is divided into let's say 100 bitcoins and these bitcoins can be token by different people so if you hold a key of that block of that one percent of the block which is one bitcoin you own that one bitcoin but then when you want to switch the ownership when you want to sell your bitcoin or give it to somebody else all you need to do is that you just give that key that key will be degenerated and a new key for that part of the block will be generated for the new owner and this is basically how transactions take place for blockchain cryptocurrencies yeah so it's really exciting that we have an ability to store value that doesn't rely on the government telling us that this thing has value instead there's this consensus approach where if everyone agrees on the red block being valuable then it's valuable and as you're saying Haas that's a really compelling way to make decisions because it means that by definition whatever's being used is the one that 
everyone tends to agree is the correct approach generally. So it seems like a good way to run things. I'm wondering, just stepping away from the technical details of how this is implemented, if we're just focusing on the store of value application of cryptocurrencies for a moment, do you guys see or foresee uh, currency being replaced by cryptocurrency? Do you think we'll stop using dollars and start using Bitcoin in general? And what implications will that have for the power of the state? Right now, what gives the American government the ability to borrow so much money at such a low rate of interest is the fact that the lenders to the American government, they know that America will never default on its loans because it has the control over its own currency. It can print more dollars to pay back any of its lenders if it really needs to. And if debts are instead denominated in Bitcoin or something else, then governments no longer have that power. And so that seems to greatly diminish their power and also their ability to control their citizens. But that's a good thing, right? Because you, as a government, give more power to your citizens. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I wasn't trying to say that that's a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah, no, interesting. I, it's interesting, yeah, because the in, in relative to their citizens, the government loses power, but it somehow enforces democratic values. Yeah, it's more of a direct democracy because I think people tend to think, oh, if the country has an elected parliament and that means it's democratic. Therefore, all the actions that that government takes are totally legitimate and totally great because it's a democracy. But in fact, there are levels of democracy. And if more decisions can be made by individuals, then that's an even freer society and even more democratic society than one where every four years, the majority gets to pick one big basket of policies. So yeah, totally. I agree. It's a, it's, it's a, it, but doesn't it seem like there, there could be problems though? I mean, government, governments are going to let this power go very willingly. So can you guys foresee, it seems like there'll be potentially a further clampdown on the use of cryptocurrency, maybe under the guise of avoiding money laundering or terrorism, because one of the compelling original reasons for Bitcoin to exist was how you can anonymously hold Bitcoin You can conceal money from the government for tax evasion purposes. You can transfer money from one country to another, evading all capital rules. So yeah, if you're interested in individual rights and you think people should be allowed to do what they want, then obviously Bitcoin is fantastic. And if it's taken as the de facto currency for the whole world, then again, that's absolutely fantastic because then I can give money to Daniel from my anonymous Bitcoin account to his anonymous Bitcoin account. And no one can interfere with that. No government can interfere with that transaction or even tax it, I think. And that's, I guess that's pretty fantastic. On the other hand, I can see there being a lot of problems with like some drug lord somewhere or, you know, Al-Qaeda getting money from all kinds of people, right? So big problems. I mean, those problems, you always had them, particularly with cash, I think. So that's why governments wanted to, maybe why cash is basically something that should be, that is tried to avoid in some countries more and more, which have problems with exactly that, with illegal transactions. So I think it's not really a new thing, but talking about taxation, like how would that work? Because if we give like, not necessarily taxation, but generally when you do a transaction, do you give money to a third party and the reason is because you get a service the transaction service so i guess there's also like these parties might not exist anymore when you do a transaction with cryptocurrency but there are other parties and as Haas was saying earlier there's also much of redundancy in computing so there will be costs how do we deal with that do you know something about that about the technical details because i don't what do you mean by that can you repeat that daniel cost like a transaction will cost something computing power and oh like, well the, it's trivial though because in order to transfer, if I want to transfer a Bitcoin from myself to you, all I need to do is send the equivalent of a very short email's worth of data to you. And then that is enough information for you to sign the key or do whatever cryptographic steps need to take place for you to obtain unambiguous ownership of that Bitcoin. And then your presence on the ledger is undisputed. And so 
the computing power to transfer Bitcoins is trivial. The computing power step that yeah. Haas is talking about is to generate new Bitcoin, which is exponentially, like asymptotically harder and harder to do over time. And that was the engineered Bitcoin work. When Satoshi, the genius anonymous guy that first created Bitcoin, set this thing up, he set it up so that there was an incentive for people to maintain copies of this ledger, which is distributed. So people need to have copies of this thing all over the world in order for the thing to be distributed for a record of which account owns which Bitcoin everywhere in the world. That thing needs to be copied many, many times. And the genius of Bitcoin is that the copying step to do that is incentivized because if you do that in certain ways, then you end up creating more Bitcoin for yourself. So like the mining incentive is what Haas was talking about there. And it gets harder exactly. and harder to create Bitcoin. Anyway, maybe I'm just repeating what you already know, but that's that's what yeah, I Yeah, yeah. That's all great. And that's all like part of the beauty. But I still think that it belongs to the cost of a transaction because the oh. like part of the service of a transaction means also the existence of Bitcoins. You know, so. Oh, I see. Okay. That's fair. That's a so, good point. So if it costs huge amounts of computing resources to create the very Bitcoin that we're moving around now, then like, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm talking, for example, a transaction usually would give money to the bank and you paid for for its services, but it might, other things they do might be much more expensive than the actual transaction. And so basically you pay for the banking system, like the services the bank offers you in total, and it's a fixed part for a transaction, what you pay, but it, you pay, maybe you, they always like try to win as well money, right? Yes. But what, There's like, hidden hidden costs yeah. yes hidden costs exactly and, and the cost for the whole blockchain basically yeah that, that's exactly the cost for the blockchain how do we calculate i suspect this? that since bitcoin are infinitely transferable once created i suspect that the cost will get distributed over many many uh, transactions and so i still suspect that that's not a concern i do think though from an economic perspective, it is a concern to have a currency that doesn't inflate at all or that inflates very slowly, which is what I guess the future of Bitcoin faces. And so perhaps other cryptocurrencies have dealt with this, I'm not sure. But generally when an economy, like let's imagine a future where the world is using Bitcoin. Now, economically, there's a problem when you can't expect that there will be a small positive inflation rate every year because prices don't adjust downwards because of human nature. Like people don't want to see their salary go down. And so it's much better. There needs to be a correction downwards to prices for there to be a small positive inflation rate because then prices can simply slowly go up and then your salary goes down. And that's a lot less politically difficult to achieve because people's nominal salary still remains the same. That's sort of in brief strokes why it's nice to have more and more of a currency introduced every year and bitcoin does a little bit of that but maybe not enough that's interesting is that really like the only basically factor for inflation why inflation is necessary for like the happiness health of a nation i think there's other reasons like you want a positive inflation rate to give the <laughs> It's funny though, I was going to say to give the central bank flexibility over um, <laughs> adjusting interest rates, but then I realized there's no central bank for Bitcoin. Yeah, I think if we had an economist on this podcast, he'd have a lot of interesting things to say about how an economy would work if it was entirely reliant on a distributed cryptocurrency. I think there might be some issues with controlling the macro economy that we take for granted right now. Like if you think there's any value at all in like a Ben Bernanke type person uh, or Janet Yellen now to influence the short term interest rate and to do other kinds of open market operations to manipulate the economy for getting it out of recessions. If you think there's any, some people think there's no value in that and that in fact, central banks are causing further problems. But if you think there's a value in that, then clearly like surrendering all control of your currency to like a dehumanized, not dehumanized, but a, a decentralized currency that no one controls may be problematic. Well, I think money and cryptocurrency is just one aspect of blockchain technology. And there are many other potentials behind the blockchain technology and consensus algorithms that is um, vast and it's not even yet touched. So basically the Ethereum, for example, which is a smart contract blockchain technology is being employed in so 
optimization algorithms for various networks, including social media networks. I recently learned about this technology called Akasha, which is a social network which is decentralized and it relies on peer-to-peer -peer server usage, which works like torrent and the hosts that you, everything is just stored, everything you shared from yourself, your data and your profile, it's stored on your own computer, on your own uh, storage and you're basically looking at each other by looking at each other's storage so there's no centralized server and it's getting popular and now you can download it basically from github for windows and mac and the technology works based on ethereum decentralization algorithm so i think money and currency is a huge potential that started to show first but i think we are going to see a lot of different applications of blockchain technology being involved in the finance industry i see Many banks now are blockchain technology for basically improvements to the way that they keep track of data and move information around their servers. So it's interesting because when you take away the political ramifications and the currency ramifications, blockchain at its base is like a form of database, right? It's, it's like just another way of organizing information. And so there can be advantages to not having to reach back to a central server to get the data that you need for like settlement instructions or something. And having a distributed architecture can have all kinds of performance advantages. And it's just funny to think of all the very mundane applications that are attached to this extremely, you know, sexy, prestigious concept like Bitcoin and blockchain. But aside from that, certainly there are applications like what you're talking about, Haas, with the social network. I feel like there might be limits there, though, because with Facebook, they have huge central data centers, right, with huge amounts of data. And I'd be surprised if there was no value in that and if it was just as good to have everyone's individual computers just talking to one another. Like, surely all of those Facebook servers are storing like huge amounts of pictures and videos that it would be very hard to maintain in some kind of shared distributed ledger that everyone could access. I mean, it's one thing for Bitcoin to maintain a ledger of who owns what Bitcoin around the world, which is probably no more than a terabyte of data at any given time. But when we're talking about like everyone's social media, that's potentially petabytes of data. And so I feel like there would be gaps and it would be difficult perhaps to access certain information, like some old video or something. Maybe it wouldn't be available. I think on that matter, I feel like you're imagining, picturing that when I talk about the personal storage, you think as an actual data storage, like an HDD or SSD storage, but you can also implement it on a cloud storage. And the only difference here is that when you're using a cloud storage, which can be rented from Amazon, from Google, from Dropbox, the only difference is that the encryption that you use to encrypt your data on the cloud can be decentralized. So every person can choose among so many various types of encryption and put their data on the cloud and use that cloud as their server of the social network and upload all their data on there. So there should not necessarily be a limit. Clouds can still be used and there can be centralized servers and clouds. But the only difference here is who controls what is shared with who. So the only difference in the future decentralized social network is that every person can be in 100% in charge of what and who they are sharing their data with and how they control the encryption of their data. So maybe the price of admission into the social network will be you need to, I don't know, like rent a certain amount of, like you need to have a hard drive that can store, or at least in cloud space, control or pay for a hard drive that stores this much space. And so as the social network gets bigger, maybe everyone will need to control like, I don't know, three terabytes or something. And then, so I guess if you divide up all the data on Facebook divided by the number of users, maybe it's a manageable amount per user. I think Interesting. so. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, that's cool. So then, yeah, that, that pivots the problem completely away from what I was thinking, where people's laptops trying to transmit data to one another. And instead, it's purely about refactoring the ownership because, again, all the data is still sitting on central servers like at Amazon or something, but the control is totally atomized and reorganized back to the individual. Exactly. Nice. That might be a problem for some of the entrepreneurial ideas. Like I think back to the 
iterations that Mark Zuckerberg has pushed through on the interface of Facebook and how in the 10 years that I've been on Facebook, how many times some new interface change has happened and there's been like groups and people complaining, oh, I hate this new interface. I can't get used to it. It's terrible. And then two weeks later, everyone's forgotten about it and they're more addicted to Facebook than ever. Like now, apparently two working days out of the month on average are taken up by Facebook use by the average American uh, office worker. (laughs) So clearly um, the interface changes were correct. And yet, if we were relying on some kind of consensus model, that might be a problem. Well, I, I don't think it would be a problem because I think what the same thing is going to happen. Uh, people are still going to spend time on social networks, but it's just not um, centralized by a control center like Facebook or Google. So people still are going to use advertisements. People still are going to pay attention to them and still spend a lot of time. But actually, I think it would be even um, a better atmosphere for small entrepreneurs because right now it's very hard to compete with these huge players as a small company. But in that space, I think it would be even easier. All you need to do is just to have a slightly better tool uh, and share it on an open source place like GitHub. And then if people use it, then you're good. And if people don't, and still every person is only in charge of what they're sharing. And still you can have your tools being marketed and people use it and you can still being paid by, I don't know, cryptocurrencies and anything. But the only thing is it changing here from my perspective is who controls what is being shared with who and why. Because right now you have the control, but it's all under the umbrella of Facebook. I mean, Facebook already has access to anything of you. And then they provide you with the control that you need, but they still have it. So there's isn't centralized, but I guess that's all you, you're going to eliminate. And you're just eliminating the big brother or in charge of the control. Well, as you're framing it now, it's a subtle change because now your social media data is sitting on the same data servers, potentially. Facebook might even still be your interface. If you're saying that third-party applications or now just any entrepreneur can access the data infrastructure of this decentralized social like API, if you will, if anyone can create an app that plugs into it, then maybe even Facebook <laughs> in, in this refactored future could create like a Facebook app that just plugs into that, into the social media data, that social network data that's in this network whose name I've forgotten right now. And so what has changed at that point? <laughs> I guess, as you say, who can, who owns ultimately the data, I suppose, but it's, it's subtle, you have to admit. Interesting. Yeah, I, I guess I have also something to add to your point is that speaking of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, the miners are the big players. For example, when it comes to voting for Segwit, for Litecoin, it's the miners that are in charge of voting. So who are the miners? Miners are the holders of these overpriced, expensive hardware. And also the ones who have a lot of money already in dollars or years in China to pay for electricity. So basically what's happening with cryptocurrency is that we are not necessarily generating it out of blue. It's not out of blue. It's we are basically transferring value from the current resources, which is electricity, hardware, which is from silicon material from the beaches and turned into hardware going through a lot of processes and manpower. And now all is happening is that all that value is being transferred into a flag called a Bitcoin into an address and now it's basically we are wrapping up a lot of value into one flag and then we can split it it's basically a standardization of value in an alternative way which creates opportunities for other small groups of people who want to follow alternative leaderships because what is universal about money is that money is usable as long as a large number of people believe that that flag has a power. So it's basically a democratic decision whether to accept that we rely on that flag or not. If today everybody decides that, okay, we don't want to work with Bitcoin anymore, its value drops to zero and it has no more value. So I think it's true that you say the people who own power and they still will be in powerful positions. So it's really hard if for somebody that is poor that has no access to electricity or paying for extreme expensive hardware he still cannot mine bitcoin so the mining 
and the source of power is still not changed a lot. It's just the transformation of it and the usage of it is more decentralized from my perspective. But but Haas, I think you're not, I don't think you quite have the power assessment correct in the sense that, yes, if you mine Bitcoin or Ethereum, you get a few more Bitcoin and so you can get wealthy that way. But competition for mining is always going to keep the profitability of that venture down almost at zero profit because if it was super profitable to do it, then more computing resources would be added to the exercise and then the number of Bitcoin mined per unit of computing power down until it became almost not profitable. So that is going to always assure the system, it's always gonna make sure that Bitcoin miners are not gonna be super wealthy. But even if they were, I think what we want to understand is that the reason the system was devised by Satoshi is so that people who are just using the system for normal transactions like you and I are able to benefit from the work of the miners. The miners are the ones maintaining all the copies of the ledgers and they're keeping all these distributed copies and the coins are their payment for doing it. So they're the ones maintaining the infrastructure of the whole system that we all benefit from and they get that payment in return and so the system works. So I, I'm not, I, the power dynamic here, I don't see any downside actually. I feel like it's a perfect ecosystem of miners maintaining the system and getting their payment for it and everyone else benefiting from the decentralized system. And then now we have this great system where there's no need for a central authority that can be lobbied and influenced and corrupted like most governments are today. The that's good news a really story. Good, that's yeah. a really good point because I, I always picture these group of people that they uh, criticize government. They're like, money is just a valueless paper. Government is exploiting people by just printing money out of nowhere and to an infinite amount. It's not true because I feel like the mechanism of how uh, cash works is very similar to what Bitcoin works for in that sense that what is money? If it's a, just a paper, so everyone can print it at home, right? So why is it not happening? Because a cash is a high technology paper. Where is the high technology coming from? It's from the latest technology that its resources are limited. So what's in key about money in any form is that it has to be a limited resource limiting its generation and its rate because it doesn't matter how it happens if it's bitcoin if it's money that has all high tech in order to make it competitive to have the most let's say robust cash that no one else can print it it's like if you can come up with a better technology that it can produce that limited resource source of a flag and can be not copied with people who cannot spend time on it because here's the thing it's like at the same time as you said the power dynamics works such that it's you cannot create bitcoin out of nowhere you have resources you can't cheat let's say the algorithm works such that you cannot cheat because if you want to cheat you have to waste a lot of electricity and then it's not profitable to cheat and come up with a fake bitcoin so Bitcoin, it's like it's politics, it's merged into its technology so that it never allows people to cheat. Because if you cheat, people are not going to trust to your block and then that block will be discontinued. So the majorly accepted block is always the one that has the most popularity and has well, the taken the majority of the resources. It's like that huge block that is going to be the next, this, uh, the, the previous block to the next one is going to be the one that the most resources are spent to come up with that. Well, the profitable cheating comes from hacking into other people's Bitcoin accounts and stealing their Bitcoin because they haven't secured their coins sufficiently. So I think there's still opportunities in this future world to do crime, but it's just in a different place. Can I say one more thing before Daniel probably has something to say? I was thinking about the problem of money laundering and the proceeds of corruption being more easily transferred around with Bitcoin because in the snap of your fingers with no transaction costs, you can move Bitcoin from one part of the world to another and you can have huge anonymous accounts full of coins. And there seems to be a huge danger there that some government official, let's say in China, 
has a huge amount of money that they've built up through some corruption in government, and now they can easily move it out of the country, whereas before it might have been much more difficult to do. Like Bitcoin is like cash, except cash that you can beam around the planet with like a transporter, right? So it's scarier in that sense for the purposes of getting rid of corruption. Now, I wonder though, if it's true that we have a cryptocurrency as our main currency in the world someday, maybe that will mean that all our governments, and maybe we won't need such big governments because they won't be running our currency, we'll have 3D printers for most things. And so maybe there will just be fewer opportunities to be corrupt because the government simply won't be that big and simply won't be doing that many things. Maybe that will be the way we can avoid this problem. And everyone can still have their anonymous cash accounts, their anonymous Bitcoin accounts, because there's not that much to be corrupt about. Hmm. Can you repeat it again in a sentence? Right. No, it does mean an inflation. It just doesn't mean perhaps enough inflation, because if you look at the growth of Bitcoin over time, the way the architecture of the coins cryptographically has worked is you get fewer and fewer coins for more and more mining. So like it's tapering off over time. So as a result, we're not getting the stable amount of inflation that you might see in a normal fiat currency. Like normal fiat currencies will grow, I guess the price index associated with the currency will grow by you know maybe one or 2% per year, ideally. And Bitcoin, I think, is significantly less than that. I could have the numbers slightly wrong. Maybe I need to look this up before publicly releasing this. But yeah, that's basically my thesis. And I think inflation doesn't happen to Bitcoin. What is happening to Bitcoin is actually actually constant deflation because inflation happens when the unit currency, the amount of unit currency increases, which doesn't happen. But that's to, what mining is. No, what mining does is basically because there is a cap to Bitcoin, you cannot, by definition, by design, you cannot have more than 21 million Bitcoins. 21 is the cap of Bitcoin. So what mining is doing is basically enabling, it's like revealing the current bitcoins to the user 14 million so right now 14 million out of 21 is mined but once all the 21 is mined there's not going to be any more bitcoin mining Aha. is going to okay. be finished mining is so we're saying be stopped. so we're saying the same thing yeah we're saying that because i'm saying that the number like the rate of inflation is asymptotically decreasing and you're saying that there's 21 million total and only 14 million has been revealed and once they're all revealed, it's done. That those two views are compatible. So I think we're exactly. saying the same thing. Yeah. Right. You're right. Right now, the amount of Bitcoin pouring to the market is increasing because every day more, every 10 minutes, one block is being mined. And we are inflating right now. But once all of it is mined, there's going to be deflation forever. So, right. uh, which is not a bad thing. It's just, I feel like, I don't know how it works, but I feel it's a different economy. It, like, uh, it means, on fractions. But, but economists will say that it's a difficult economy to run for various reasons, but maybe you're right. Maybe we'll just deal with it and somehow people will just get used to, I mean, that's what we did under the gold standard, right? Under the gold standard, the amount of currency in circulation was basically fixed. So it's kind of back to that again. I didn't understand your question. Well, like it's the value of the currency is changing constantly and makes it very difficult to imagine its use as a currency for everyone to regularly use. Like if you're planning on going on vacation and then suddenly the cost of your vacation doubles because the, your Bitcoin is like dropped by half in value, like that's not really an acceptable way to run things. So I wonder if more hedging technologies will become more widely available or more easily implemented right now. Now, if you if you're engaged in like an international business transaction and you want to hedge against the currency risk, you can purchase options market that will offset your risk. And maybe in the future, that will become a very normal thing to do if you're engaged in a transaction where Bitcoin is one of the legs, but not both. That's one idea. Another might be, yeah, some kind of government intervention to keep Bitcoin. But that, I guess, how can you do that? I, I don't think you can. I, I don't think that would be a, a good thing either. Maybe with more people using it, it will stabilize. Exactly. Because right now, I think a lot of the movement has to do with speculation. And if, if it's being extremely widely used, then 
at that point, the speculators will be only a small percentage of the total value of Bitcoin. And then they can't make the value go up and down so crazy anymore because most people using the currency will just be doing regular things with it. And so they won't be able to just pull their money out randomly because of confidence reasons. Going back to what Michael was mentioning about volatility and stability of a currency, I just want to agree with Michael and add that uh, it's correct that the number of users define how stable a currency is going to be. It's very beautiful since I've been monitoring the cryptocurrencies since six months ago. At the beginning of the birth of each cryptocurrency, the volatility is huge because it's very limited. So the fewer the decision makers of demand and supply, the more volatile. And also going back to the uh, idea if is the cryptocurrency is going to be universal and everybody use it. From my perspective in future, we are going to have a diversity of currencies as we have today based on nationalism. So right now, each nationality has its own currency, right? And there is a universal currency that is also not completely universal. Like it's true that most countries use dollar for international trading, but there are still certain countries that use different currencies for the international. There's different allies, different networks of allies. So if we really believe in decentralization as an ultimate goal of humanity to be more effective, I think we've been more and more and more currencies added to the collection and not even less so i don't think bitcoin is going to be the one or any other cryptocurrency is going to go to be the the one currency of the universe of the human civilization we're just going to have so many points yeah Yes, I have some strong thoughts on this because it seems like many technologies that are compatible with a more libertarian future, one where the government is less involved in our lives, are also technologies that assume that individuals will take more control or be more responsible for themselves. To just take a very simple example, if you don't have the government providing health care for you, then we rely on individuals to go through the steps of getting health insurance for themselves. And often, that process can mean that you can have a more customized health insurance that would be better for you. But it is true that it demands that the person not simply completely abdicate responsibility and just not get any kind of insurance. That obviously leads to a worse outcome than if the state simply provided it for them. So I think in the same way with currencies, if we create a world with multiple competing cryptocurrencies that each have various advantages and that introduce a world with all kinds of competition, different applications that can be used on them, and that also prevent government governments from inflating the currency abusively to prop up regimes or to have excessive spending, then we have a much better world. But once again, it relies on the individual, as you say, pushes complexity to the user. But now here's the technology that may fix that for cryptocurrency and for others. And we can say it all together, artificial intelligence. So <laughs> if we all have intelligent agents, a Jarvis in our ears, then perhaps even the least sophisticated among us will have a big brother in our pocket guiding us through the incredibly complicated transactions of the future. Yeah, and an interesting part to add to what you just said is that each currency is a product by itself. Each currency is a tool and you can sell or buy the tool itself, right? So right now, Ethereum has the ability to have smart contracts. Bitcoin is different from Litecoin in terms of its cap. And it's also SegWit is now a feature of Litecoin, which Bitcoin doesn't have. So the diversity of currency comes from the services that each of these currencies can provide and the activities that users can do based on of each of these currencies. So that's why I think diversity will always be there because none of these currencies can provide the complexity of their services to its totality. So each currency is a certain activity and trading and the right. type of tradings. Aha, so instead of currencies being split by geography, they'll be split by application, which may make a lot more sense anyway. Nice. Exactly. One day, if you want to just do grocery, you know that you're going to use currency X. And if you want to get paid for your work and pay somebody else for the work they're doing, you're going to pay by currency Y. 
So wow. there will be a split of currencies. That's fascinating. Anything else, guys, or should we go to the elevator pitch? I'm done. We can go. Nice. There we go. All right. In this elevator pitch battle, each of us will give one business idea in less than 30 seconds. Then we will each vote on the best idea. And of course, as always, you can't vote for yourself. All right, let's begin. And round one is Michael or me. In Southeast Asia, it's normal for high-rise condominiums to have a pool on the top floor or at least somewhere in the middle of the building. But instead of a pool, which is like not very unique, what about a wave pool? So I've seen these in a few water parks and it creates these huge surfing waves and you can actually surf on them, right? and it creates this standing wave. Now, wouldn't that be the ultimate luxury? So on the high-rise condominium surfing wave, and that's way beyond a normal swimming pool in terms of luxury and coolness. It would simulate the sounds of the beach, and it would be much more fun than a normal pool. I guess there are already pools that they have uh, motors that generate waves. What's the novelty? Right. Sorry, the novelty is that it's on the top of a high-rise condominium. That's the novelty. I guess, I guess, okay, look, if you want the real reason why I'm giving this one, it's because I've been looking at all kinds of condos to move into here in Bangkok, and they all have a pool on the top floor. And I'm like, well, that's nice, but wouldn't it be, and, and then, but then I watched a YouTube video of some wave pool, and I was like, oh, well, wouldn't it be cool if they put that wave pool on the top of the building? I mean, I'm sure that just with that, they could attract more customers to that condominium. It's, it's not a world-changing idea. It's true. <laughs> yeah. uh, and now we have round two, Daniel. All right, let's hear it. So habit reversal training is still one of the most effective treatments for diseases like skin picking disorder, which is something I have experienced with. And the treatment includes noticing when you start touching your skin somewhere and becoming aware of why you do it. So asking yourself, okay, how, how did you feel at the moment? Is it because of stress or boredom, etc.? So AI is basically, I mean, nowadays it's easy to, with AI, find out what is happening on video. So I suggest a camera that monitors you while you're on your PC, which is one of the, at least for the skin picking disorder, one of the common locations where you do it. And then basically always notifies you as soon as you start touching your skin somewhere. And that makes sure that you always recognize it because in the beginning it's very hard. And also it, it will make the treatment easier and, and maybe more effective although we don't know maybe also some of the effectiveness will get lost because you're not aware of when you start doing this yeah but that's the idea interesting oh so you're talking about a behavioral feedback system that can monitor you and then give you a feedback or a notification or hey daniel stop don't talk bringing the subconscious activity to your conscious awareness, right? That's fantastic. It reminds me of a study I read about where you can ask people how happy they are and they'll report something. But if you do something like you have a smartphone app or something and every 15 minutes it like dings a bell and then it asks them to like rank how happy they are. And then it like often you can use that information to like get a much better sense of in real time what makes people happy. And what that shows is that actually people tend to be happiest, not when they're doing things that you might imagine would make them the happiest, like doing relaxing activities, but instead like when they're in the flow state, like when they're really focused on work, that's when they rank themselves as happiest. And I was thinking about how maybe I could incorporate that like into my life because I, I record a daily diary and I write down what I do every day. But I wonder if it's like full of hindsight bias and got all kinds of problems. I wonder if I could more quantitatively do it if I just had like a, yeah, a smartphone that pulled me every 15 minutes to ask me what I'm doing. I'm sorry, that's not exactly your idea, Daniel, but it's in the sense that it like it's like a smartphone thing that reminds you to be self-aware, I guess it's similar. But yeah, you have a great idea, probably more marketable too. Uh, I just say one last thing. I find that because I procrastinate a lot, like I'll suddenly browse Facebook at some random time. I imagine I'm not the only one that does this. But what I've noticed, and I haven't been systematic about noticing this, but what I've noticed is if I'm in the middle of work and then like my mind drifts to some like slightly less pleasant topic, it could just be like I'm worried about, I don't know, having to say something to somebody or, or maybe there's some ambiguity, then that will drive me to like immediately switch to some distraction like Facebook. And so I feel like there's that self-awareness there that just by thinking about that, I, I realize, oh yeah, that's 
why I'm doing this. Now, whether that's actually solved my problem or not, I'm not sure. But I agree that insight into what causes the behavior has got to be part of the solution. So anyway, that's great. So it's crunch time, Haas. Now it's round three, Haas. So uh, here's the problem. We all have plans and scheduling different projects and dividing our time and life into pieces of management. But it's always hard to keep track of them and having uh, updating them spend, uh, waste a lot of time. So there's studies that show uh, the advantage of change. For example, if you want to have a running activity three times a week, if you draw chains of each of them and then if you keep track of each of them, so uh, it gets psychologically more cumbersome, more scary to break that chain when you have that chain. But if there's no chain and you just want to do it sporadically, uh, it's really easy to forget. And it all comes from the difficulty of human beings to deal with So these chains always help us to break the eventual gratification to small gratifications which is keeping track of the chain so what if we have an application that gives us the visual tools of blockchains that we can assign different activities and to manage our times and splitting our projects into several different chains and blocks so that we can keep track and it can also it would be like a mixture of google calendar with social networks because then right now you can share each calendar to each other what if we could share the chains with each other so that if for example we all had the two hours of meeting today sunday from 10 to 12 a.m and then we all have that unit so the our going to be merged together for three people and then they're going to be diverge again to different activities each of us are going to do something else in uh, the chain of our consciousness so the technology is basically an application that i'm thinking to design and develop wow oh thank you i, I actually was searching for uh, so many applications of this one that you mentioned is there a specific one that you have in mind you can introduce to me okay life hacker don't break the chain yes yeah, it's it's a good idea to combine these different concepts. I'm having a hard time imagining exactly how it all comes together, but that might be the sign of a really good idea that I can't grasp it instantly. So I just I feel like a, a lot of my processing resources, my brain processing power is being spent most of the time on managing my activities more than I spend on doing things. For example, when I'm within the two hours of coming up with solution in one of my electronic projects, half of the time I'm spending, it's unconsciously going towards, what if I shouldn't forget that? I shouldn't forget this. Uh, am I gonna call my sister tomorrow? Am I gonna talk to that person on Tuesday or not? So there's so much back processing that is happening because of the mismanagement. Even though I have a Google Calendar, I have all my days for each week settled but also another problem with Google Calendar is that sometimes if there's a chain of events and I just break one, if I miss doing one of them, the whole chain has to be updated and I have to manually update the Google Calendar each by each, every day, every single day. And that's very time consuming. Sometimes I just don't do it and then it messes up everything. So if there's a real time chain that updates itself, if like it doesn't move to the next block, I finished it. And it also has a time cursor that it shows you. Have you seen when you're downloading an app on your phone, there's a circle that is being complete. Starts like uh, with an angle of 10 degrees up to 360. So imagine each block has the time information on it. So when you, you, you always know you are right now in which block. You're in the block of resting. You're in the block of sleeping. It's like you have to plan your sleeping too. So you know that you're in the block of sleeping. and. It always has the alarms and notifications set for you. And for example, at the beginning of each month, you just set your whole month based on the projects you have. And you can have your meetings and schedules. I guess it's just a combination of all these apps that each of them are insufficient for me. So I'm just thinking of this huge project. I have a lot of like graphic design in my mind Hard to explain them in words. All right, everyone. Now it's time to vote on the winner. So you know the drill, think of who you think is the winner. And now we'll say three, two, one, Daniel. Daniel. Haas. All right, 
The winner is Daniel. Congratulations. That was a cool idea. <laughs> yeah, great idea. Thank you, everyone. This was really fun. I had a great time, and I'm excited to see you next time. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye bye. Good night and good day, respectively, everybody. Ooh.